بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم سالار خان ہیئر اینڈ ٹو ڈے ود واٹ ود دا بگننگ آف اے نیو ٹاپک ود دا بگننگ آف دا نیکسٹ ہاف آف دا کورس فائن سو وی ڈن ود دا مڈ ٹرم اینڈ آئی ہوپ یور ایگزامس وین رائٹ اوکے اینڈ یو کین لیٹ می نو اباؤٹ یور مارکس یور ایکسپیرینس ان دا ایگزام فائن ان دا کامنٹ سیکشن سو ٹل ناؤ دا تھنگس دیٹ وی بین ڈسکسنگ وار پارٹ آف دا مڈ ٹرم کورس From today, we get into the final term. So, the chapter number three, basically the heading is Fourier series representation of periodic signals. In this video, we may not touch Fourier series, but that's the heading of the chapter, so I gave it. Well, you know it very well what a Fourier series is. Fine, you would have studied it in your mathematics courses already by now. Because in our university, we studied this in the fifth semester, complex variables and Fourier transforms. So we studied a, a great detail of the Fourier series and Fourier transforms in our fifth semester. So you could say that was a prerequisite to this course in the sixth semester signal and systems. So I hope you have that knowledge of the Fourier series, the mathematical aspect of it, the mathematical point of view of it. So basically coming into it, we would try to wrap up the previous knowledge and we'll get to introduce you to a new, a new topic today. Till now, what we have been discussing, what, were, what was our main objective, our main goal? It was what? To represent a given signal any given signal in terms of a linear combination of a basic signal. So this was what we had set a goal for ourselves that we would be having any general signal and we would break it down, we would decompose it and we would you know write it, we would express it in terms of in terms of some signal, in terms of some easy signal, some basic signal. And what was that basic signal to till today, till the previous video, the basic signal that we were talking about is the unit impulse signal. We talked about the unit impulse signal, unit impulse response, convolution sum, convolution integral. We break the given signal as a linear combination of, of what different impulses, right? So that was what we, see till, we saw till now. We saw in the discrete time, this is how we represented a given signal in terms of the basic impulse, right? In the continuous time, this is how we represented it in terms of the basic impulse. So, aren't you fed up of that? You know, we have seen enough of it. We've seen enough of the impulse signal, the impulse response and this and that. So why not we move into another signal? Why not we find ourselves another signal that we can express our given signal in terms of that signal, which means that we want to find ourselves a new basic signal, right? So we'll come to that later that what we would be seeing the basic signal. But first, let us see the desirable features of a basic signal. What feature should a signal have so that we could we could term it as our basic signal and represent other signals in that in terms of that as well. So the first is that the set of the basic signals should be able to construct a large and a useful class of signals. So this is your number first point that it should be able to construct a large and a useful class of signals which means that it should not be limited to a limited number of signals if it could not express the more generalized or the more practically used signals we would not be taking it as our basic signal the basic signal would be that in which we could in terms of which we could represent a large number of signals and a large number of practically applicable signals so that would be the first characteristic of a basic signal the unit impulse that we took till now any signal that we have taken <coughs> sorry we have represented it in terms of the impulse so the first criteria the impulse fulfilled the second is that the response of an lti system to each signal should be simple enough so this each is referring to the each basic signal the response of this LTI system to each basic signal and I wrote it in the wrong place so I'll put a bracket 
So to the each basic signal should be simple enough. Now why should the response to the basic signal be simple enough? To provide us with a convenient representation for the response of the system to any signal which is constructed as a linear combination of these basic signals. So you have a basic signal, the output to that you would generalize it as the output to the impulse we generalize as impulse response. So similarly another basic signal you would generalize the another. Let's say x is the signal so y is the output we have generalized for that. So now if we have the input that is a linear combination of x. So we know that the output through the superposition property of the LTI system that the output would now be a linear combination of y. So this is the second property and the second property also the unit impulse exhibits. It has the property number two as well that if your input is represented in term in linear combination of the unit impulse signal the output is equal to the linear combination of the output to the impulse. You know that if delta of t is your input, h of t is your output. So this is the convolution representation. So this was general. This was a general feedback from the previous things that we've studied. Now comes the next topic. The next thing is that we are fed up of this convolution representation. X of k into h of n minus k. We don't want it anymore. We want another convenient representation. We are tired of using the impulse signal, h of t. No, I want another signal. Fine. So in the beginning of the course, we have been introduced to some basic signals, unit impulse, unit step, this and that. But the signal that our book now refers to, we would be dealing with is the complex exponential signal. So, we've already seen the complex exponential signal in what? In the basic signals. Now we do what? We see the complex exponential signal in terms of the LTI systems. So first, I would have to remove the board. Okay. So now what the heading, uh, what is the heading that I give? I give the heading of an alternate basic signal. Alternate basic signal. And what is that alternate basic signal that I'm taking over here? That is the complex exponential signal. Complex exponential signal. And you know what it is. Okay, complex exponential signal is now the next topic. After this, maybe in the chapter to follow, we would be dealing with this particular signal. So, in the continuous time, it is represented as what? You know it very well. In the continuous time, it is represented as an exponential of ST, where S is generally complex. So in rectangular form, if I represent it, so you have a sigma plus j omega. Sigma is the real part. Omega is the imaginary part. Fine. Similarly, uh, you have a z. In the discrete time, you represent it with a z. z to the power n. Now what do you have? In this particular case, z is complex. And what do you do is that in the continuous time, we generally take the rectangular form, whereas in the discrete time, we generally take the polar form. So let me see what they have written. R exponential of j omega. So they have written is that R exponential of j omega. So this is, uh, you know, the exponential signal in continuous time and discrete time. <coughs> So I'm not feeling a little well today, you know, and I have a cup of tea for that, so I'm sorry. Well, you guys would be also taking tea. Anyways, so uh, this is your what? Uh, this is your exponential signal. Now what do you have? We have a speciality of this exponential signal. 
and what is that speciality that when you give this exponential signal let's say in the continuous time case you give it to your LTI system the output is what so you have a special type of an output similarly if you give it in the discrete time case you give it to your LTI system as an input the output is again something a special sort of and how is that so I would tell you that in the continuous time when you give exponential you get back the exponential you get back the exponential whether in the continuous time case or the discrete time case you get back the exponential function but multiplied with a scaling factor an amplitude scaling factor over here we have an h of s over here we have an h of z h of z right so this is number one speciality of what <coughs> i'm sorry this is the number one speciality of of this exponential signal that we are using over here fine now from the mathematics point of view if you have a signal you give it to a system you get it in the output back the same signal so that is called the eigen eigen function of the system a signal so you write it please you write it for yourself i will write it with the blue pen so that you you match it over here so you write it please a signal for which the output is a signal for which the output is some scaling factor times the same input a signal for which the output is some scaling factor times the same signal so that signal is known as eigen function of the system eigen function of the system if I repeat it once again, a signal for which the output of a system is some scaling factor times the same signal, that signal is known as eigenfunction of the system. And what is this scaling factor called? This scaling factor is called as the eigenvalue of the system. So this scaling factor is the eigenvalue. The constant factor is known as eigenvalue of the system. Fine. Is that fine? So now I wrote it over here like this. That this exponential of st is the eigenfunction of the system. Z to the power n is eigenfunction of the system. Similarly, h of s is eigenvalue. h of z is eigenvalue. How is this? Why is this? So let us prove it. We see it. We see it through a proof. Because we should not believe. You should not believe what I am saying over here. So let's say I prove it. So what is the proof that if my, <coughs> sorry, my x of t is, you know, equal to exponential of st, fine, and I give it to an LTI system, so what would be the output of my system? So this is what I have to prove. So over here I would prove it for the continuous time case, over here I would prove it for the discrete time case. So what do you have? We know that the output y of t is equal to the convolution of the input times the impulse response. Right? And this is represented as a negative infinity to positive x of tau h of t minus tau. And this integration is with respect to tau. Or, or I can write what? I can use the commutative property of the convolution to say that the output is the convolution of the impulse response with the input. Which means it could be now represented as h of tau into x of t minus tau and this integration is with respect to tau. Now why am I interested in the commutative? Why? Because I don't know about the impulse response h of t. Fine. So I know about exponential of t. That is my input to the system. So I could shift it. <coughs> well. Right. 
Isn't it like this? Yes. So this is a convenient way to do. So I'm using the second thing. So now what do I have? I would now find my y of t through what? My y of t is equal to, uh, I would write a negative infinity to infinity. Uh, h of tau, I would write it like this. And then you have h of x of t minus tau. So over there, I will write exponential of s. And in place of t, I would write t minus tau. This is with respect to tau. I could write a negative infinity to infinity, h of tau, exponential of st, and minus s tau, so I would write it separately, minus s tau. And this is integration with respect to tau. So have a look, exponential of st would come outside of the integration. So my y of t, y of t is equal to exponential of st, <coughs> and multiplied with the integration negative infinity to infinity h of tau exponential of negative s tau and d tau and isn't it like this it is like this so which means that i've got my proof i have got my proof so let this be my proof that y of t would be something like this so y of t comes out to be what the input times the scaling factor and the scaling factor is what h of s is equal to h of s is equal to what so i have a call and let me let me you know shut it down so h of s is equal to this thing this particular integration negative infinity to infinity h of tau exponential of negative s tau with respect to tau so this is my h of s isn't it like this so this is the eigen eigen value of the function this is the eigen value of the function now have a look this eigen value depends on the impulse response of the system so you should know that this eigenvalue that is h of s this depends on impulse response of the system so which means that if a impulse response of the system is unique for any given system so this would imply what that the eigenvalue would also be unique for a given system is that fine <clears throat> yes now what do i have this was for the continuous time case now let's say I give it in the discrete time case so again I have what my x of n this is z to the power n this is given to an LTI system and I want to compute my output that is y of n fine so my y of n again would be uh, you know uh, like this would be the convolution of x of n with h of n or by using the commutative property and you know the reason h of n would be convolved with x of n so which means that i could write my y of n as what uh, uh, you know summation k running from a negative infinity to infinity h of k into x of n minus k fine so now if i put the values over here as i did in this case so my y of n would become what my y of n would become equal to uh, first of all the summation from negative infinity to infinity h of k right and then in place of s of n so i would have it like this z of n minus k so i could write it separately which means that if my k is varying from negative infinity to infinity so i could write it at h of k then i could write z to the power n and z to the power negative k so z to the power n is constant which does not depend on the on the summation so i could take it outside of it so my y of n would be equal to z to the power n and then summation would be of h of k into z of minus k and isn't it like this so it is like this and have a look what do we have i've got the proof i have got the proof of it that my output is the same input back the input times some amplitude scaling factor and this is my h of z my amplitude scaling factor h of z is now equal to summation 
k running from a negative infinity to positive infinity h of k into z to the power negative k this is my amplitude scaling factor <clears throat> i hope that this is clear isn't it okay moving on now we talked about uh, superposition we talked about superposition we know that if the input is a linear combination of what we know that if the linear uh, input is a linear combination of these exponentials so the output would be also a linear combination to the of the responses to individual say, uh, to individual exponentials right so let me you know <coughs> i have some space so if i have this much of space this is enough so if i am given a signal that is where it is okay wait here we are given a system we are talking of a system of course so x of t and it's given to an lti system and we have an output y of t so the signal that is given to me x of t is equal to let's say it is a superposition so it is a one exponential of s1 t plus a2 exponential of s2 t plus a3 exponential of s3 t and my y of t is unknown so you know what do we have you know that you know that if this is an lti system this is some weight times the complex exponential signal so if you have an input that is s1 of t so what do you have if you apply it to an lti system the output would be the same signal a1 exponential of s1 t multiplied with some scaling factor h of s1 similarly if you have a2 exponential of s2 t you provide it to your lti system the output would be another scaling factor h of s2 times a2 s2 t if you have the third harmonic exponential of s3 t lti system you have the output some scaling factor h of s3 times exponent a, a3 times exponential of s3 t so these are the outputs to the signals individually if the sum the superposition the linear combination of these three signals is provided to the lti system which is like this the output of the lti system would be the linear combination of these signals that is the response to the individual signals so my y of t would simply be h of s1 times a1 exponential of s1 t plus h of s2 times a2 exponential of s2 t plus h of s3 times a3 exponential of s3 t that is it that is it so <clears throat> i think that is it for today so if these were for three for a third order system you know we had three harmonics but what if we have you know generally generally so i can write it like this uh, that if this my input is represented as uh, you know x of t is the summation over k over k right you have an exponential a k exponential of s k into t right so for this case my output would be what y of t would equal what would equal summation over k and what would you have h of s k and exponential of s k t and of course the weight so i would write it over here that is a k fine so this was for the for the continuous time case now in the discrete time case again if my input is that is x of n it is represented as what represented over k the summation over k you have an a k z to the power n the output of this system would be what so you have a z k to the power n right the output of the system would be y of n would be 
uh, h of uh, z k times the weight that is a k and then the same signal back so z k to the power n and the summation of course summation of course over k so this is it for you know the general introduction to these topics of a, a background development from the previous topics and getting in the way to the next topic so i finish this video over here I'll see you in the next one where we do what we, we we start the new topic till then take care of yourselves and everyone around you and do remember me in your prayers goodbye